Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Slide Into My DMs, uh, part of the D4 network. This is the show on the network that is basically a D&D talk show uh, where we discuss D&D rules, D&D news, and basically uh, just try to give tips and advice for how to make sure that everybody at your table is having as much fun as possible. So thanks for being here. Uh, my name's Colby, and with me, as always, are some of my favorite people, some of my DMs. We have uh, Preston, we have Tori, and we have uh, newly once again resurrected uh, Corey um, with us. Welcome back <laughs> I, to the I really the need to stop uh, checking for traps and <laughs> finding them in improper ways. Uh, yeah. Next next time when, you, when you're when you checking the rope before you go dungeon delving, you got to make sure it's not frayed or like mm, Dallin right. hasn't come and... Yep. Yeah, yeah. Get, cut, get, giving it a head start. Um, <laughs> so happy haircut, Corey. Looking Thank sharp. Thank you. And and Dallin or uh, Dallin, Preston, tell us about um, tell us about the artwork that you've got there behind you. Mm, all right, let me see if I can get my chair to lay down. Nope. Anyway, <laughs> send our hearts. We'll just do that, and you can kind of see through my chair there. Um, this is for uh, the last recently released episode of Tales of Naria. Just um, two days ago. Just two days ago, my character um, Victor had some cool things um, as far as like forging goes and this is the byproduct of that so yeah go check awesome. it out find out what a it's little about. magic item yes yeah. and and uh we've we've we had a lot of fun i my my character sarah down actually got to do the it, tori allowed me to do the um the recap yes. letter for, <laughs> yeah, for that. So and, <laughs> and, and so i had good. a lot of fun with it I did. there's an easter egg at the end for sarah too you mean the medallion? The, the locket, yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. That, that artwork was, was fantastic. That was the that was the point that I exclaimed out, like you clever bastard. I, like, I actually <laughs> like I'm 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 straight up one hundred percent not lying. Like when I saw that there was a pause and then the signature and the artwork like chills like yeah. all over my arms yeah, and like all down my good. legs. I was like, Oh, that was awesome. That's so exciting. It so was annoying. yeah. Then I, when I first listened to it and I'm like, he's like, I've had the worst flatulence ever. When I start playing this, I paused it and I go did I get the right file? <laughs> is this well, and, uncut? Or, and, and then I and, listened to it where I was like, oh, okay, okay. And what was in. great was how you um, you changed the font. So originally yeah. the font looked like it was in uh, Eve's uh, handwriting. You, you know what I, you switched I, fonts. I thought about doing is I was like, maybe you should have Tori say, say it in her voice. And then so it's whatever. And then we can like have you both talking the same line and then just basically fade. slowly fade one to the oh, other. Oh, that would have been good. <laughs> that would have been good. That would have been uh, well. Hindsight, hindsight, twenty twenty. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we've. I've kind of been hinting at the fact that we're planning on doing something for our. You know, when we hit twenty thousand subscribers, um, in the past we've done like a little PVP fight when we hit five k, and then we did like a PVE. Uh, you know, player versus dungeon master. How about that? <laughs> yeah. PVD. <laughs> PVD. Um, <laughs> At 10,000, there's the 10,000 subscriber gauntlet for those who have not seen those. And at, for 20,000, we have a plan. There's a small problem, and it's that I'm going to be out of town, I think, when we actually hit 20,000, if, you know, if trends continue as they are. Um, and so we're going to release a little sort of like, hey, here's what we're planning on doing um, when we hit 20,000 subscribers. But the actual... Uh, thing that we're going to be doing will probably be a week or two after that once we get it all recorded and edited and stuff like that. So it'll be a little delayed, but just stay tuned for that announcement. Once we hit that 20,000 subscriber mark, we're, we're close. We're like 500 away at the time of this recording. So if you haven't subscribed, do tell your friends, get us there. Um, but anyway, it's going to be a team PVP fight. Yeah, so we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna split up into a three v three, and everybody's gonna pick you know one of my previous builds, and we're gonna fight to the death. <laughs> And I'm we, actually really excited about it. Remind me, are we doing blind pick or are we just saying like, here's what it is? Um, it, we'll, you'll see. We'll find oh, out. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Find out next time. So that's the announcement for the day. So let's jump in. Uh, as usual, I have a quick ruling question that I want to ask you guys about and then a longer conversation. Um, so as for the quick ruling, I'm going to ask you one question and, and ask you guys to tell me... Um, rules as written, your interpretation. And then I'm going to get into the specifics and see how far you would let me push this at your table. How about that? Because um, I think I know what you're going to say rules as written. I might be wrong. Um, but I also think that that 
that everyone's going to want to draw a line in the sand here somewhere <laughs> so that it's not sort of um, what's the word I'm looking for exploited too much this particular thing that I have in mind. So oh. the thing that I have in mind, here's the question. Can you give items, you know, uh, whether it be a weapon, armor, um, magic items that require attunement, okay, to your like summoned creatures. So this, this of course, came up in my build this week, the, the Fey Wanderer. Um, right there, where a big part of what the character was doing was relying on a summoned fey spell to have their fey, sometimes two fey uh, creatures, like fight for them. And yeah, I kind of wanted to know, okay, could I give my my summoned fey a magic sword, for example, and let them use it? So, so the question: Can you give items, weapons, armor, magic items, etc., uh, to your summoned creature, whether that's your familiar, your homunculus, your steel defender, your found steed of the find steed spell, you know, summon fey, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Can I do it? Yes or no? Rules as written, I couldn't find anything about like not being able to let your uh, creatures have items. Um, the limits, of course, are a can they conceivably wield that item? Mm -hmm. Holding right, it, yeah. that because a bird can't really. I mean, they can't really wield a great sword, unfortunately. Sure. Like sure. as cool as that would be, unless they're a big bird. Big bird. Um, yeah, big. I see big bird wielding a great sword. He's a barbarian right. for sure. Right. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Do they have the intelligence to use it if it's a attunement yep. item? And yep. his. Uh, and that, his... that needs to be the next build, Colby. All of the Sesame Street characters. The big bird barbarian in D and D. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Super um, Grover is a paladin. With, uh, got, the, with, uh, the count uh, is obviously Strahd. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Snuffleupagus, the, the Loxodon. Um, yep. Okay. Monk. What? Make him a monk. Yeah. That's no, totally going to happen. It's got to be something. Uh, he's got to be a rogue <laughs> because he's got to be invisible, right? Nobody really knows that Snuffleupagus <laughs> is there. So he's got to be like a rogue class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really think I really think that there is the only limits are the limits of the creature. Right, because uh, uh, conceivably, I could say like, yes, your your owl familiar could hold the dagger and wield it, but they will not be proficient in that weapon. Sure, they will not get any sort of proficiency bonus for it or anything like that. So it might be it might be harder to hit. Um, I would say that intelligence on the creature does matter for things like magic items, because uh, you have to be at least semi intelligent. Or if you know, like, okay, again, this is rules as written because. Sure. Cor internal Corey is saying like no nah, Corey come on it would be so cool it'd be so cool if they could just use magic items right. um but yeah I and there's specific rules for getting armor for a steed a standard like summon steed so I or not summon but a standard steed just a so. regular war horse kind so of I, thing yep so I can't there's, just take a human mithril armor and throw it on a horse no but they do have like you can buy armor barding uh, yeah barding and armor barding. Uh, for horses so right yeah Okay, um, Preston, Tori, yes, no, agree, so, disagree. So I'd say rules is written yes because it says a, a creature, but again, with the caveat of what, what Corey's saying, um, that if the creature can use it. And one yeah. further Does their question, biology actually work? Uh, Tori? We're all on the same page. Okay. The, the, yeah, same thing. Do they have the strength to carry the item? Do they have the intelligence to wield it? Those would be my only concerns. Okay. Um, in that case, let me let me see how far I could push this, um, as I am wont to do. So, all right, we we we've talked about like giving a steed armor or barding, right? I think everybody's yeah, that works. Um, what about giving um, giving your familiar? Uh, like a ring of spell storing that they could then use because you can communicate with them and tell them what to do uh, that they could then use to like cast a spell. Yes. As much as, as much as I would hate to say yes at this point. Yes. I, I technically yes. <laughs> assuming it's intelligent enough to do a, an attunement. Yes. You know, yeah, I think if, if, if they can wear it, then yeah. Okay. 
Um, right. So it has to be able to fit on their body somewhere. But if you're a, if you're a horse, I mean, where would you put the ring on your tail? Maybe those right. ring base of the tail, uh, <laughs> an ear, you okay. know, you could have it. Yeah. Um, Okay, so it seems like everybody's saying yes. Rules as written, you're saying yes. Would you allow it at your table? I would say it would have to mechanically fit, and, and this is a, the a finger thing. But it would have to mechanically fit. Well, no, no. Like I don't care if you put a ring on the horse's ear or something. But like for the staff of healing, for instance, right? A horse walking around with the staff of healing in its mouth. Right. Uh, a free healer. I don't know. Assuming I'd have that... to be convinced, I, I guess is what I'm saying. I'd have to be convinced in some cases. I'd have to be heavily convinced that this familiar is is that dexterous enough or that smart enough or something, I feel like. I because I feel like it would be, it would cheapen, I, I don't want to cheapen the PCs with an NPC. Sure. Yeah, it's familiar. definitely it's definitely one of those situations where I'm like, you give you give me a really good reason and let's talk about this a lot rather than just being like, oh yeah, sure, you can just you can just attune to whatever because because then you you do have a a familiar running around just casting a fifth level you know spell every combat kind of thing and it's like, right. however, the balance on that is while yes for like the first combat of the day you can cast like the night before you can cast a fifth level spell into it or several spells. Uh, everything after that is your your caster is using their spell slots for that it's basically mm -hmm. just rolling it over it wouldn't it would be the same as if you were rolling over your spells it's sure. just that you get to basically do two in a turn a few times and which, if it becomes a problem usually mad. familiars don't have that much health mm -hmm. so as a bad, even big bad evil guy i could go poof and then be like oh huh, that look, is i have a ring one thing that is one thing to definitely look out for is your your dm may start targeting your familiar more because of that not because i'm not out of spite just because it's a threat after after that tiny bird casts a lightning bolt out of it like <laughs> the the hobgoblins are going to be like uh maybe that bird's a little bit more powerful than we thought it was you know. A bird with one hit point. Yeah. <laughs> Fear me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, uh, that that was my thought, right? It's like uh, we've had conversations in the past about, well, like, does the DM target the the familiar? I mean, come on, it's just a little owl or whatever. Uh, and and I think most DMs, not all, would probably say, eh, like, the the monsters aren't going to perceive it as a as a huge threat. I'm not going to target it. Like, it's giving you advantage one on one attack once per round like you know what i mean i'm not going to kill your owl every time we get into combat but if your owl is like concentrating on the haste spell from you know 100 feet in the air and and really making you a lot stronger well okay now if if you're going to if you're going to play a little cheesy then i'm going to play a little cheesy <laughs> and one way to look at it also is narratively if, because there's plenty of fantasy books out there where the uh, the main character has an animal companion of some kind, whether it's Guinevar, whether it's, you know, Hedwig, something like that. And there are moments where the the familiar does get attacked, you know, mm -hmm. fa sometimes famously killing that, that familiar also or that, uh, yeah. Exactly. And it's one of those things where it's like you have to you have to be aware that the more you engage your uh, you're familiar in that fight or your companion in that fight, the more of a threat they're going to be and the more of an active role the DM is going to think that they're taking in the story, which means they are subjected to just as many uh, threats, if not uh, if not all of the threats that you're facing. Right. Okay. Um, then the then the last one I'll ask is specifically uh, important for the build that I did this week. And um, what about like magic weapons to specifically to a summoned fae. We're, we're told that the summoned fae makes attacks with a short sword. Um, right. So rules is written and rules at your table. Do you see any reason why I couldn't give my fae, say, a, a plus one short sword? No. Unless it's a sprite. Yeah, like if it's a tiny fey, like they can't yeah, build a short sword. Physical I, I think, characteristics matter to me. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I think technically in the spell, it's said that the fey that you summon is small, but so is there, not tiny. But if you bought a <clears throat> a plus two letter opener and wanted to give it to him, then sure. <laughs> so yeah, so maybe again, you get it specially crafted. Buying magic items is a really good point here because most like D and D does not account for magic item shops. 
typically. It's a, you find a plus one magic sword and it's like the most amazing find your party has ever has ever found, you know, yeah. let alone finding anything even rarer than an uncommon weapon or armor, right? So mm-hmm. in, a, in a normal conceivable rules as written game, finding three plus one swords is going to be a feat in itself and your your other party members are going to be like why do you get to keep the three yeah. plus one swords because you're familiars you know you're you're summoned fey it's like it's like what what the heck is going on here like why can't we have these plus one swords and that's something right. you work out however in a magic system uh where there is a magical shopping yeah it's just a great gold sink for the dm to be like yeah you go ahead and spend money on a redundant sword that gives your your fey uh creatures a plus one bonus to attack yeah. and damage and and you know for me my major concern with wanting this really for this character is that if as i think most dms would rule that fate doesn't inherently necessarily do magical damage for the purposes of overcoming resistance to you know non-magical attacks um the the spell greatly loses its uh you know power if uh you know when you're running up to (laughs) at higher levels especially at you know running up over and over against you know creatures that are resistant to non-magical attacks and so it's like well you know if we could if we could give the fey like a plus one sword then that kind of solves that problem and lets the spell you know continue to scale a little better as you know you increase in in power levels um okay well then maybe final question uh tori what happens to the magical sword that I gave to my Fae after I lose concentration and or the spell ends and they and the Fae disappears. Does it take the sword with them or does the sword fall to the ground and I have to give it to him again next time? I would here? say, <clears throat> I'm going to be a bad guy. I would say that it drops to the ground, honestly. Okay. I'll, and, I'll, I'll and, second that bad guyness. That, can, yeah, I, that's... can I take it even further? Yeah. If it was an attuned item, they lose attunement because if they're without mm. that item, and they're so far enough distance, I'm pretty sure there's an yep. excerpt in there that says they lose attunement. Mm-hmm. And, yep. and and that's actually a good point. That that's that sort of puts a limit a little bit on on like the power of the magic item because a lot of these, like you summon a creature, they only last for an hour or less sometimes, mm-hmm. right? And so if it, if it requires a short rest Some to attune to something, then it's like, well, you, you can only take this so far, right? You can't give them an item that requires attunement if they're only if the spell only lasts for an hour. Exactly. So, yeah, I mean, then, of course, there are things like a homunculus or a found steed or a familiar or whatever that, you know, last much longer awaken, sometimes kind of if you de- awaken a tree. Sure. <laughs> um, welcome welcome yeah. to the land of the living. Here's a magic sword. <laughs> Go kill something. <laughs> and in 30 days, hopefully you don't want to kill me. Yep. Yeah. And I've thought, too, about like, gosh, maybe I could increase like the phase um, defense if I gave him like some magical armor. They could, they could like, but, but then there's nothing in the spell itself that, that indicates to me that this creature is proficient in any sort of armor. So eh, that probably yeah. doesn't work. Right. Um, and then even then it takes, how long does it take to don armor? Like depends on the armor. 10 right? minutes for like yeah. full plate, I think. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, oh, that's not really going to work. Don't and then know. they disappear in this little teeny suit of armor <laughs> falls to the ground. <laughs> it, it could be one of those things where you talk to your DM and you use the armor as like the binding catalyst that the, the Fey appears in, mm-hmm. which could be cool. But that, again, that's something you'd work out individually with your DM and they may or may not allow it. Right. Just a soup can with holes in the side. And this is my, this is my quick Don and Doff armor. Just click. Yep. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Okay, so um I think we're pretty clear here. Any like any other lines that you would draw in the sand that maybe we haven't discussed as far as what you would allow for like summoned creatures, familiars, you know, companions that you've constructed, et cetera, et cetera, to to equip and or use items that you give them? I would just say that, like, don't automatically assume that your DM is going to be okay with anything. Like, talk with them and yeah. and see how they feel about that specific situation. Even if you've done something with your familiar in the past, maybe don't assume that you can also do that with your summon creature sure. or that your familiar can pick up another item or something. Like, obviously, every creature has their three attuned items that they have to be limited to, mm-hmm. but definitely don't just say, yeah, you know what, this is this is how it is. My DM said it once. Yeah, I just I shrivel up and die inside to think that someone out there is going to do pixies with a bunch of rings of stored 
destruction and killing and whatever and then they're gonna polymorph everyone and all else gonna break loose yeah 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 <laughs> yeah it's such I, a weird like specific build that i don't know how it would ever come around in an actual yeah. campaign setting I, I get i get requests and suggestions uh, like this on on you know my videos uh, semi-frequently i feel like where people are like well, keep in mind that when you get seventh level spells, you could do like a, a a simulacrum and like, and then they could like buff you in these ways and you could give them these magic items and they could do all these things. <laughs> and you can, you can put a ring of spell storing on your familiar and then they can blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, uh, yeah. like, I don't like th that very well may be possible, but like, I just don't think I'm ever going to create a character like around that because there you it, it feels so like exploitative <laughs> potentially that i just have a feeling that a lot mm. of dms out there would be like aren't they stupid i'm gonna expensive? draw the line here right uh Can't yes remember. yeah it's like 1500 gold worth of ruby powdered ruby and it takes yeah. 12 hours to cast the spell and they only have half of your hit points they don't regenerate their their spell slots um you know they're fragile etc cetera, etc cetera. and but, but then of course people are like well but if you had a wish spell you could just wish them into existence and i'm like if you had a wish spell like now like this is no longer an optimized character build it's just you have the wish spell do whatever yeah. you want all right so let's move on to the uh to the longer conversation so today i wanted to talk about one shots um this is a term that gets used fairly frequently, I think, in the D&D community. And I, I very often assume with this and with a lot of other sort of D&D vernacular that people are just going to know what I'm talking about when I use the word. And it's probably true that 90% of my viewers might or maybe more. Um, but it's also probably true that there are people out there who don't necessarily know what I mean by a one shot. And more importantly, um, even for those who do, I think there is a lot of fertile ground here to talk about, like, why do we do them? And, you know, what's some good advice for like the do's and don'ts when you're trying to create and run a one shot campaign? Um, so let's start out with a definition. Um, Corey, I didn't warn you about this, but as the um, as the as the current grand poobah of our table, um, why don't you why don't you tell everybody in your own words um, what you think of when you think of a one shot? Okay, uh, a one shot game is uh, typically a game where the DM announces that they are going to run a mini adventure of sorts. Uh, they say, "I'm going to be running a fifth level adventure." Uh, here are the class restrictions, if there are any, your typical kind of like, almost like you were setting up a campaign. Uh, but basically it is a single contained sessions game. There are, isn't anything, there isn't anything that uh, sets up for any sort of grand campaign or there shouldn't be, we'll get to what I do in a little bit here, I suppose. But uh, there, it should just be kind of just a fun little side romp or it, and it can be something related to the universe that your main campaign is in or if you're between main, main campaigns it could just be something to introduce a couple new players into D, &D by giving them a little like standard adventure you know yeah, it, yeah. And, and usually usually you can do something kind of wacky with it if you want to with a one shot or you could do something super basic that uh normally your players would be like okay well we know that like we've had this story 10 times, we've heard the tropes before, but you could do something a little bit more, bit more tropey when it comes to a one shot because it's just a single game. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, then quickly, um, Preston, Tori, help me out here. Um, why, 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 why do this? Why do a one shot when, when you could be playing a, an epic grand adventure uh, instead? What, are, what do you think are the most common reasons for why people would wanna do one? Um, I would say like right off the bat, I think something that's appealing about it is that it's really easy to commit to, right? You can commit to one session. Anyone can commit to that, I hope. Um, it, there's less pressure, I think, to have like the perfect character, have the perfect story as a DM. Um, and uh, like Corey... Sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say, like, you say that, but of course, in my head, I, th I think of every one shot that I've done, and I promise you that without fail Six i've spent on the i've spent more time <laughs> creating the character than actually playing the character um because i in my head i'm like no i have to create like the perfect 
most powerful character that I can possibly <laughs> come up with, even though I'm only going to be playing it for like three hours. I like it. So, okay. Anyway, for, for to each their own. People, right? it's... <laughs> for normal, healthy, balanced people. <laughs> Anyway, yes. sorry. Continue. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, Corey touched on it's it's a great way to get other players interested, like new players interested, and and expose them to the game. That's how I was exposed to the game was we did a one shot, and um, he also said, you know, you can kind of have fun with it. You can really experiment in there, and it's a great a great way to just try something new mm. and see if it sticks. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And maybe it doesn't, and maybe it's a huge disaster, but that's okay. It was just a one shot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then you could just forget about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not uh, not a lot invested, again, for most normal people. Yeah. Right. Preston, <laughs> uh, Preston, are we leaving anything out? Um, oh. Other other good reasons. One one that we've actually talked about in the past is I think they can be a great filler for times when maybe not everybody in your party is able to play the big grand epic adventure that you're you know currently sure. running. So it's like, hey, we you know we want to keep momentum going. We still want to play. Everybody loves D and D. Like, let's do a one shot. And like Corey said, whether in the world that you're currently running or something completely different, um, you guys. Each each of you, I, I've played in one shots that each of you have run, and and I and I enjoy them. Um, I've I've loved all of them, and and you know some of them are kind of fairly standard, like sort of quick setup adventures. Um, you know, Corey Corey did one at Halloween uh, a couple of years ago, and it was like it was D and D, but it wasn't really D and D. It was a it was a teen horror flick basically right and and <laughs> and we all had to choose from these pre-made characters and one was like right. the jock and one was the cheerleader and one was the i don't remember you know one was the nerd or whatever <laughs> and we had to like escape this haunted house or something like that and it was you know it was great and kind of wacky and fun and and yeah good time i think my favorite thing about them is like you said tori like uh it's a great place to like try on new new characters and see if they fit right yeah. um and be like okay i want to play like uh, my first hexblade that i ever played my only other hexblade other than sari was in a one shot and it was like oh okay like this is kind of fun like i could see i could see myself like building a character around this and then another one that i did uh tori that you were running was a moon druid and it was fun but i think by the end of it i was like you know what i don't know that this is for me i feel like this might get a little samey, a little boring uh, for me. Since then, my opinions changed a little bit as I've kind of learned of other things that you know you could do as a moon druid. But anyway, um, yeah, it's just a lot of fun to sort of scratch that itch of I've been wanting to try this particular character. Mm-hmm. We try it out in a one shot and like, hey, that was a lot of fun, or eh, that wasn't that great. Um, and then you know help you decide on like the the next character that you're going to play for your next big epic campaign, right? I'd say also totally. a one shot is a great way to give your uh, your standard DM a break mm-hmm. and to DM for your DM, basically, you know, mm-hmm. which we had a whole conversation about last week, if I remember. Well, I mean, I was in there. I was dead. We were dead but yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Rest but, in peace. Yeah. <laughs> was it peaceful? Uh, no, it never is. It's just <laughs> fire, brimstone, pitchforks. <laughs> in that in that same vein, um, I think there are a lot of similarities between courting and tabletop RPGs, in the sense that you don't walk up to somebody and say, "Hey, let's get married," or "Hey, whatever." Like there, there's a very large level of commitment and you don't and fear that is. I wonder it hasn't worked for me so far. Because I don't know about you guys, but I, I ha- there's a lot of social anxiety. I feel like that that happens nowadays, where it's like, okay, you know, if I I don't want to commit to something until I know that I'm absolutely going to love it, um, or there's those you know those social gatherings, and especially with people, it's like I don't know these people that well. Maybe mm-hmm. they're people from work. Maybe they're just you know someone else's friend of a friend, and I don't want to like crash the party, so to speak. That those um, those first dates or the, that basically coming together and being able to say, hey, like, is there a chemistry with the group um, on a fundamental level that we're not going to beat each other's throats within a couple of weeks? Yeah. So so it's like a like a test drive, not only for a character, but potentially yeah. for a, a new, you know, group yeah. of people that you're or if you have a, you have an existing group and you're trying to, to incorporate that one person in instead of putting that person into the existing campaign where it can be kind of hard to break that shell, put them in that one that mm-hmm. one shot scenario. So. Yeah, hmm, I like that. I would say um, maybe also a good way uh, as 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 someone who's considering being a DM, a good way to let them you know try it out, 
see if they like it no? see if it, see if the glove fits you know they might they might get through a one shot and be like oh that was like so stressful and really... i just really didn't have very much fun or they might have been like oh my gosh like yeah it was a little rocky but like i can see the potential here and like i want to tell stories you know the, at the least of whatever um you've planted the seed and if they didn't if like maybe there was something about that campaign that they didn't jive with eventually they'll probably find their way back to a, a table and you can kind of take their temperature too and say okay is this player a do they love puzzles do they love like because if, if you're one shot hey i'm trying out a whole bunch of puzzles and they absolutely hate it okay maybe they need more combat maybe they need more rp what is it that, that drives them so yeah cool okay so in that case i want to move the conversation towards advice um so I want to talk about both like the do's and the don'ts when you're planning and then also running a one shot. Okay. So, so <laughs> let's start with, um, let's start with the don'ts. Let's start with the pitfalls. What are the potential challenges that you run into when you're trying to plan and run a, um, a one shot? What are things to avoid doing, um, when you're trying to plan and run a one shot? What, what advice would you give, uh, to people for things to, watch out for and avoid? I feel like it's a, a double-edged sword on the, the thing <laughs> that sticks out to me. Like I wanna say, don't stress out about it too much. You know, it's, it's just a one shot. But on the other hand, as a DM, there is a certain level of, um, you have to guide your players to a certain extent because you don't wanna go too far off the rails. So I feel yeah. like there is some extra planning that may need to go in, in, into place here for, for your one shot, just to keep everyone on the right track. Um, so that it can, they can get to the end of, of the goal there. Um, but yeah, in that same vein, like, don't, don't worry about it too much. Like no one's going to care in the yeah, end. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. I would say one thing is don't plan too much. Like, um, and, and to go kind of hand in hand with that, make sure your combats aren't over, hard over difficult um because if you have if you plan like a small little dungeon crawl for your one shot and you've got three different encounters and they're all deadly encounters that's gonna take a long time and you gotta kind of you gotta kind of understand like well, your time management is important in a one shot because if you don't finish it then your players are left kind of going like well what happens next what, yeah. what do we do and uh, one thing is always to make sure you know what time frame you're working with like with our group typically our games are uh, three hours at the maximum mm -hmm. but you know it might be that your group can meet on a saturday and do like a full five to seven hour session and you just want to do like Ooh. this big dungeon crawl one shot which Ooh, that sounds exciting it doesn't it sound fun. nice <laughs> it, it is it is a lot of fun but there is that it, there is a lot more prep work that goes in with that um one thing that i would say is don't just uh don't just assume that your party is going to uh, get everything right away if you do add any sort of puzzles or questions like uh, like Tori said you kind of have to guide your party a little bit uh, with one shots especially because you don't have a lot of time to get through everything so if they're really struggling with a puzzle uh, like give them hints way earlier than you normally would kind of thing just because it there there comes a point where it's just like uh, well all we did was sit in this one room and try and figure things out for an hour and that wasted like, most of our one like shot an, time it's like an escape room that we never got out of <laughs> <laughs> yep um i'd say another don't don't do level one I, i'd say level three minimum but like level level four to five would probably be a good starting point just because level one is so weak like mm -hmm. it is meant to be weak right. to like for to start out just to make things simpler but you only get like three spell slots as a level one caster and then you're, you're done for the day later. right yeah. it's it's yeah. sad and on the other end of that spectrum if you do a high level one shot i would recommend as a player choosing some a class you're already familiar with mm. because if you choose something different like if i go a sorcerer i've never played a sorcerer i've never yeah. dm'd a sorcerer um and if I, well, actually I did DM a sorcerer, Tori. Yeah. <laughs> but for the most part, I relied on her and Colby to remember the rules for the sorcerer because. <laughs> yeah. So don't, so don't play. You something. relied on me. I relied on Colby. That's how it worked. <laughs> <laughs> so I, it's one of those ones where don't, because otherwise you're going to be, you're going to get through the fights and you're constantly going to be like, oh, I forgot about this. Oh, I forgot about this. And it, at the end, you're going to be like, I was worried about the character the whole time that I didn't enjoy playing the game. Yeah. 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 And I, I would add to that, like, maybe don't 
don't get too caught up on rules as written. Like I hate to say mm-hmm. that, but I think that can really drag the game down if you're just constantly worried about people breaking the rules. Right. Let, let's just if, let the story flow for this one yeah, shot. Right. I, I'd say unless you know the exact page you're looking for, don't look anything up in the rule book. Yeah. yeah. Just make just make a snap decision. And just say, okay, for this situation, yes, you can leap like this, and this is how you do it, and then we can worry about the rest of the stuff later because it does it does bog things down when you're trying to look in the rule book for everything. Okay. Um, anything else? Any other pitfalls to avoid that we haven't mentioned? I just don't go too big like they said don't yeah don't get too grandiose because one shots aren't meant to be grandiose they're meant to be pretty linear and I say grandiose I'm and I'm referring not you can make a combat epic without making the story length right how yeah. how, how about this how about this I maybe would just add don't be afraid to let it go into more than one episode if yeah. everybody's having fun and you're enjoying mm-hmm. it and you think there's there's more yep. room here for additional story. To D&D. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like, we've played, I've done, for example, like Preston, you did a one shot for us like probably three years ago <laughs> that turned into a two shot and it still not done. And I was having so much fun with that character. And like, I really was invested. Like I still remember pretty much everything that we did yeah, and like what our objective in, was. You guys are still in the closet with like- And it ended on goblins. a huge cliffhanger. And <laughs> like ever since I've been like, I wanna finish that. Like, I wanna know like what happens and if we can, you know, <laughs> save the princess and kill the dragon or whatever. Um, so, so yeah, you know, as long obviously as like, as long as time and schedule allows, like be mm-hmm. open to, you know, continuing on and that maybe that just means it's a two shot or maybe it turns into like a full-fledged campaign and uh, you know obviously as long or as a mini campaign that. um one thing and kind of leading into the dues one thing that i like to do uh is to relate the one shot into the same world with maybe some side mm-hmm. characters mm-hmm. or a side plot um w- because like it gives you a it gives you like a look into how things are going on this place that the party has already been to um and b it allows it allows the players to kind of get uh, flesh out the world a little bit more with an extra character you know yeah i, I know we did a one shot where we uh, had everybody play members of a thieves guild basically except me uh, yeah except for except for colby was playing their normal character yeah. as a one shot and that allowed us to establish a lot more of your character colby's character's backstory uh and then there, we also had a one shot that happened at a town that you guys had visited to changed fundamentally and you guys got to see what happened with that town mm-hmm. and how it kind of evolved Oh, yeah, and, and Rogma obviously were. has ramifications leading into Tales of an area. If anybody's seen the latest episodes, yeah. so yeah. even awesome. picked up on those Easter eggs. Yep, fun, love it. Yeah, um, no, I, I was gonna say that that was one of the more memorable one shots that we did, and I love the idea of um, you know just continuing to flesh out the world. I think as a player, you always get a little. There's a little part of your brain that kind of just gets tickled by like, oh, like this is like, I know what this is, or like, oh, this is the, like, in this relates to, you know, the other campaign that we did in these ways, or this is this character that's like coming back. That's always fun. And Mm -hmm. I think that's particularly uh, useful and handy um, when you're doing a one shot because somebody else at the table, like can't be there or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's just like, okay, well, let's kind of flesh out somebody's backstory or have a dream sequence or, you know, flesh out maybe some antagonist or other protagonist NPC or whatever that just adds some sort of depth and breadth to the world. Um, And, and then still does all those other things that we've talked about that are great about it. Like let them try out a new character, let them, you know, Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Well, I I really like that too, because then you, you have that opportunity um, tying into the, the new players, you know, where, now everybody let's say you know you have a new character a new person that's wanting to come to your table and everyone's okay with it run the one shot and then everyone else is basically like supporting characters in that particular person's story so that when they do come in and say hey this is who i am this is where i come from everyone else at the table kind of even though your characters don't have that that context it's a little easier to to play off of each other in yeah those and they're, they're a little more invested maybe yeah yep. so okay so we've we've we have segued into the dues so uh, we've covered one. What are some other? What are some other things um, that? What 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 other advice would you have for people that they should do while they're planning and running? Do shot. it. Do just it. do it. Just do, do it. it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just run one. Don't be afraid. Yeah. Jump no. In. I I I completely agree with that. Uh, absolutely, run one shots 
like if you've got free time and you've got uh, if you've got if you've got people in your life that you want to just run a one shot with you know outside of your core group absolutely like that that's fun and it allows you it it's so freeing not to have to like sit there and like think about the overarching campaign or anything like that if you're just like man i really have this idea in my head of what it would be like to do like a pirate campaign and and i want to try it out and i want to see like what it's like just do a one shot pirate ship you know high seas adventure and see if you like it and if you do you can roll that into a campaign later on it allows you to kind of do these wacky ideas that you've been thinking about but really can't find a way to fit into your campaign yeah i like that you know i think one of the downsides to a one shot is that sometimes it can feel kind of clunky at first and so one thing that I would recommend doing, and Corey is awesome at doing this in like our Tales of Maneri, Aneria campaign, but he'll start start by sending your characters, your players, um, some, some like little backstory type thing, something that they can start the game out with that can tie in to the one shot. So maybe explain to them a, a relationship that they have with an NPC that you're going to be having appear in this one shot. And so when you get to that point, they're like, I know you and mm-hmm. it, it kind of helps the the story go along. So an example of Corey doing that is he had um before we started Tales of an Area, <laughs> he had sent um to to me uh, a message from Eve's employer Lucan um with some instructions of what she was supposed to do and and one thing that he mentioned in there was to stop by Nico's sweet shop and to pick up a sugar bomb. And so it was really exciting when we got to Six Hills and I my character just knew to ask about Nico's sweet shop and it was something that he had planned for us to go to anyway. So I, I really love that idea of planting these little seeds beforehand so that it can make the experience better as you go through the one shot. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. What else? Like I'm, I'm thinking specifically for me, the, the biggest, the biggest pitfall uh, or challenge seems to be, and you guys kind of talked about this already, but like, time right it's very it seems very difficult it seems like more often than not one shots that i've done um either don't quite get finished after you know a single sitting uh, or like the the dm is very obviously like cutting stuff and like oh, railroading you kind of at the end because we got to skip this part because this is going long kind of thing so so you've kind of mentioned some things to avoid doing what are some things that we should make sure that we do um, in order to keep things streamlined as we're planning and as we're running. Um, any, any other tips along that line? Don't overcomplicate it. Mm-hmm. Make it, make it very straightforward. Like you got a quest from the King, save the princess from this dragon's lair. Boom, done. That's it. There's the lair. It's got one path that leads into the lair. You know, like yeah. you don't need to do like all these side tunnels with the different encounters and everything that's for campaigns. That's for people who have time to spend, you know, exploring every room and who want to do that. Yeah. You know, if you have a dungeon, it's got two rooms in it. It yeah. is a basic, it is a basic, like skill test puzzle encounter yeah so maybe do railroad your characters a little bit like more than you would in with the one shot or or at the very least if you give them the illusion and say hey there's like 10 paths but ultimately they all go to the same room (laughs) yeah (laughs) do you want blue green or red it doesn't matter because ultimately you're still going to fight the dragon Hey, you yeah. you make you make the illusion of choice. You give them all these different paths, but they all have the same single encounter in them. And then when right. the, your players ask, like, "Well, what are these? What were the other paths?" and you'd be like, "You'll never know." You'll never, yeah. you know. And neither will I because I didn't come up with anything. Yeah, maybe the the doors slide shut on the rest of them as they choose one, and yeah. then that's it. Or yeah. But another thing that I think um, could be is a do um, is when your when your players do create their characters for this one shot, assuming there's a theme or some kind of overarching tie that that you've kind of put in place um find ways that if that character is a rogue and they're really you know they built it all around stealth find a way in that one shot to allow them to have that one moment of mm-hmm. like at least one of those like feeling cool about that rogue yeah. or the barbarian if they want to have that that standoff where they're in a room by themselves and a and hundred kobolds come at them at the same time and they somehow like relentlessly rage against this for a few seconds before it abates and then the big bad comes out and then they fight him uh, you know like give them give give people the opportunity to have, to get that core of that character that they were kind of like reaching for because otherwise it's going to be one of those where you kind of reach for it and they just feel like it 
Yeah, no, I, I like that. Like nothing would be more frustrating than to build an assassin rogue for a one shot and never get a surprise attack mm -hmm. on somebody. Yeah, right? you still you still have to make sure you're you're giving your players what their character is built for at least a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Or to have an evocation wizard and never really have any combat encounters that have like Huge three mass. or more like semi weak, uh, you know, minions that you could mm -hmm. just blow up with a fireball or something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, and I think uh, to allow for that, it it would be great to have just like a mini session zero um, before mm -hmm. before your one shot. You know, just like connect over like a thirty minute Zoom call so everyone can introduce their characters to each other. Then you as a DM know how to build your one shot around their characters and then yeah, sure. you can hit the ground running as soon as you get together so you don't have to explain mm. who you are you're just ready to go yeah or at the very least I, I i would assume you could maybe accomplish some of that with like text you know like a text message or something like yeah. as, as or, a dm you could say hey everybody you know i want this information about your character and like you know what what are you looking to accomplish like what's your character's yeah. strength in combat or something like that when this this other this one i think i think jenny d shout out to jenny d uh, did a conversation about this about sending prompts right so if maybe they let you say hey i want you to build your character do your typical flaws and everything else and here's three questions i'd like you to answer while you're doing that hmm. and then just send them to me that's all i need and then based on the, your answers to that and any other information you want me to have about that character that can help, you know, streamline that process. Cause you know, in some cases with the sessions zero, if people are super busy or whatever else, like definitely at least give them the ability to, to have that conversation, open that door. Yeah. I'd, I'd also that say as a player, try out something new, try out something that wouldn't be something that might not be optimized, something that you look at normally and go like, oh yeah, this this build is typically very weak, but it looks really fun. You know, try it out, it's a one shot, who cares? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I will say that, uh, that having done that at least one time, one of my favorite one shots that we've ever run, Corey, was the one that you did and I played, um, I played an armorer and I, and I've and I've sort of publicly said I don't love artificers. It's not really my thing. I don't love the artificer feel in D and D. It's just a personal, like unobjective, senseless bias. And I I had a blast playing that armorer. Um, it felt really cool. It felt really fun. It felt really different. And I found myself thinking, you know what? Like I could totally see myself doing this like in a in a yeah. longer campaign. That's like yeah. Tori's Tori ran one um, a one shot campaign that I really loved, and it was and I I can't remember it was the I was playing Gadling, the turtle. You were a turtle. It was awesome. Barbarian or something. I don't know. Yeah. And he was like constantly drunk and constantly angry, and it was just like it was fun. It was just like. So they I had never... to tie a rope to you and carry you along <laughs> on your shell. <laughs> yeah, turtles are just fun to play in general. Let's be yeah, honest yeah. here. It was just, it was just, it was a screwball kind of fun, whatever. Yeah. And and you know, we ended up killing the mummy in the end, and it was just, it was a lot of fun. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Oh um, man, I'm uh, sorry. Quick, quick side side story that may get cut. Um, but I ran a one shot, and uh, I had them fight a mummy in like this tunnel, and it infected uh, one of the players with mummy rot. Yeah, yeah. And um, and the, they had ten days to get back to town, and so each day they were like rolling to see how much HP they lost or whatever the curse is. Anyway, to see because they didn't have a remove curse, and the player they made it back to town on the day the player died, and they had to like do some other form of resurrection on him, and it was really cool. Oh, nice, nice. Um, how it. how about this? You guys may disagree with this. I would say as a DM, do feel free to TPK your party. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Because, Absolutely. Because, you know I have no problem killing people. Because it's a yes. one shot, and it's like sometimes <laughs> those those stories and experiences are are super memorable and fun, and can create a great memory. And it could almost be like like oh like we died and we lost, but it doesn't carry the same weight as getting TPK'd like in a larger campaign that you've invested months of time into a character, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Where it's just yeah. like, oh man, we died. That was amazing. I can't believe that he crit me or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. And 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 might, he, might even set up like the Second next one, one shot. shot as like a revenge yeah. quest, right? The big bad yeah. suit. And the other thing is like as a player, I've always wanted to play a game where like everybody's happy-go-lucky, you know, we're playing happy tree friends all the way to the end. And then I betray everyone. Like. <laughs> 
-hmm. I would love nothing more than to be that douchebag in a one shot where it's like, oh yeah, you're at the end. Oh, stab, stab, stab. Ha ha, the gold is mine. Come get me the next one shot. And see, I have, I have betrayal. Uh, I have done betrayal pod or not podcasts. <laughs> I have one shots <laughs> where uh, players have betrayed the party towards the end. And it is like, even for it being one shot, it was absolutely <laughs> it devastating. Hurts. Like it everybody hurts. was like, are you kidding me? Like with this kind of stuff. And yeah. it was a great, like it was memorable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're not super emotionally invested in the characters like you are in a regular campaign, I think it's that kind Hurts of less. That, yeah, that kind of <laughs> story trope or whatever is a little easier to deal with and is just yeah. kind of fun and things than than it is. Uh, than it is when Victor betrays awkward. you at the eleventh hour of the campaign. Who knows? I, I, I we'll can be feel watching it coming. for that. I now. know it's coming. <laughs> Dang it! <laughs> You've given All yourself away. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, one more do I, I thought of is be sure that your players pick like magic items and things like that before mm. before you start your one shot because you're not going to have time to go shopping. Right, right. So take, shopping so, yeah. does take up a lot of time. So if that's something that you're going to allow, right, then not, not, all, not all one shots would, I suppose. But yeah, typically when we play, like there will always be a hey, you know, do we get any magic items? If so, like of what rarity and how many? Right. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, get those a all picked out. A player you don't do engage and have fun and and be as immersive as you can in, you know, having fun here. Don't be a spotlight hog because everyone's there mm -hmm. to have fun and there's only so much time that can be played. Right. Yeah, especially in a one shot. Yeah. Um, there's not a lot of time for a lot of like exposition about your tragic backstory. <laughs> yeah, there's not a lot of time for the dm to try and curve that you know in a three-hour period or if right, anybody's uh, if anybody's ever seen the second gremlins movie um there's a scene in it where well in the first one uh, the girl describes why she hates christmas uh like the main love interest and everything and it's this kind of really like it's it's a little bit of a horrifying moment but in the second one they're uh they're starting to run around this tower and she starts she starts describing oh it had to happen on lincoln's birthday and here's why i don't like lincoln's birthday <laughs> and her, her her husband interrupts her and he's like babe i love you but we really got to get moving like we don't have time for this yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they were they were doing a gremlins one shot mm-hmm um, for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess, uh, again, uh, just getting back to kind of that constant theme, right, of like, you got to keep it moving. Like, don't over plan it because you might not get to everything that you're planning for. Like, do whatever you can to speed up combat. Like, don't use, like, uh, don't use the uh, conjure animals spell. Don't be a necromancer. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yep. Uh, any of these things that like have combat that just really can kind of get bogged down, like <clears throat> try and avoid that. And, and if you're going to do that, keep your, keep your DM fully involved in the process so that you guys can work something out and make it as quick as possible. Yeah. Cause, cause li trying to limit somebody on a one shot, it seems kind of crazy because they are supposed to be the crazy moments where you try out weird things. Um, but it's definitely one of those things where it's like, okay, you need to work with your DM though. And you need to tell them exactly what's going on and what you need or what you'd like to see done so that they can work with you. And you don't have to worry about making 20 attack rolls with your skeletons and instead right. they can all make like one, and you can do like one group attack roll or whatever. Sure. Sure. Okay. Anything else? No, just have, right. fun. have fun. Have fun. Have fun. Main cool. reason we're here. Well, bring thanks. snacks. Yeah. Bring oh, snacks. Yes. Always bring snacks. We forgot the snacks. That, that, that applies mm -hmm. to really any, D D session. All everything in life brings snacks. <laughs> yeah. You having Technical a baby? Offerings. Bring snacks. Bring snacks. <laughs> um, nope, Go just ice room, chips. Take some snacks. You know, <laughs> she'll kick you. She'll kick you in the face then. Um, okay. Thank you uh, to all of my DMs. I appreciate you guys as always. Um, love these conversations. Have a lot of fun with them. And um, I think we, we covered a lot of good ground. I hope that uh, you watching. Um, enjoyed it and I hope that you will leave us your advice for running one shots and tell us about your your favorite most memorable one shot moments and um, yeah and and also you know times that you've maybe had a one shot that really failed hard and, and why um, we, we want to hear all the stories and all the advice so thanks for watching love you guys um, and yeah I guess that's it have a fantastic day and we will talk to you soon bye bye, bye.